Bueno, ya está. All right, so we can start. Welcome everybody to to our seminar today, to our IFIMAC ICMM uh, online seminar today. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Natalia Ares. Natalia uh, was born in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, and she studied there uh, physics. And she actually did a, I, I, I learned that she did a, a master on, on theory and, and, and quantum chaos theory, which is, <laughs> she's not <laughs> experimentally, but it's quite impressive that she, she started doing quantum chaos. Then she moved to Grenoble, uh, to Silvano de Franceschi's uh, lab, where she did a PhD on silicon qubits. She did a, quite a, 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 an amazing set of experiments uh, around this uh, uh, qubits with silicon. Then she moved to, to Oxford, like uh, around 10 years ago or so. She recently uh, got uh, promoted to associate professor there. And uh, she has been really successful in attracting important grants, uh, uh, starting from a Marie Curie Fellowship, then some uh, Royal, what's the name? Let me read it. Royal Society uh, grant in the UK. And recently she got an ERC grant, an ERC starting, starting grant uh, last year, I believe. And this, this re her research is around uh, applying uh, artificial intelligence and uh, concepts from quantum therm thermodynamics to, to different aspects of, of quantum devices and quantum technologies, qubits, and so on. And uh, this is actually the topic of the talk today. So again, it's a great pleasure for uh, having Natalia here today. Uh, thank you for accepting the invitation and the, the floor is yours, Natalia. Thank you, Ramon, and I, I, I'm really grateful for the invitation and, and uh, of being able to show our work uh, today. So uh, let me uh, share screen. Uh, oops, uh, just a second. Okay. I believe now you can see my screen. Yes, go ahead, Natalia. Perfect. Okay, so um, today I want to take you on a, on a bit of a journey that starts with uh, quantum devices, but going from thermodynamics to artificial intelligence. And uh, the question is, how are we are going to connect these two um, uh, things? Just be patient, bear with me, and hopefully uh, you will understand um, how, how, the, uh, how these two things connect in our lab. Uh, in and in our work. Okay, so let's start uh, first with uh, thermodynamics and why it is interesting, why we believe it is uh, interesting. So, um, you know, one of the most groundbreaking experiments in physics goes back to 1849 when Scholl demonstrated with this apparatus here that the work of, of a falling weight. Uh, could be converted into the heat of agitation in water. So um, this was uh, this experiment was at the heart of the first law of thermodynamics uh, that was followed by the second law and the introduction of the concept of entropy. So um, what do we want to do now? Well, what we want to do now is to uh, perform uh, measurements of work, uh, understand entropy, link it to heat, and all these thermodynamic quantities, but in the quantum regime in which fluctuations are important and, and uh, quantum coherence can emerge. So uh, for example, how these quantities work in a two level system and what does ha that has to tell us. And this is our uh, first hint of how um, information uh, has a role in thermodynamics and this was um, Maxwell's uh, uh, thought experiment, a Maxwell demon. And the idea was to show, well, was a paradox, right? That, um, that Maxwell presented in which the idea was that you have a volume with uh, hot particles and cold particles here, they are red and, and, and blue respectively. And what uh, Maxwell thought was that, well, okay, there could be a, a demon 
that sits in a partition with a small uh, window. Here you can see this um, uh, white um, window. And uh, you know the idea is that you will let uh, just uh, accumulate hot particles in one side of the um, of the volume, uh, basically transferring heat from a cold reservoir to the hot reservoir in apparent violation of the second law of thermodynamics. Of course, this is not the case. Uh, what was understood uh, quite a, a lot later was that. Uh, there is a role of information in thermodynamics. There is a cost um, for erasing information. And that's why it compensates. Uh, that's why the second law is actually not violated in this setting. I, I invite you to play this game uh, that one of my uh, students, Brandon, uh, um, put together. Uh, it actually measures your entropy reduction, and uh, it's quite fun. So. Now, uh, what can experimentalists do uh, in order to understand better uh, quantum thermodynamics? Uh, well, in particular, uh, electronic circuits are, have been quite useful because, for example, it ha they have allowed us to uh, build uh, sealer engines. This is an information engine um, with um, single electron boxes and also a quantum dot engine with uh, nanowires. And uh, in these settings, we could start exploring uh, these, these, well, the role of information and um, how thermodynamic quantities, quantities uh, link to each other at the nanoscale. But of course, these experiments still are um, classical in the sense that there are no quantum effects, no coherences that enter um, into play. So um, actually, solid state devices have shown this is possible, that we can do experiments in which we can explore quantum thermodynamics as such. Um, there has been a, a, a beautiful experiment, a quantum heat engine in an NB center ensemble, and um, also a quantum Maxwell demon uh, made of superconducting qubits. Uh, so this has shown the potential of solid state devices um, to explore um, the realm of, of uh, thermodynamics at, at the nanoscale. And now uh, what my group is bringing to the picture here, it's a mechanical degrees of freedom. And the reason is that mechanics is a type of energy that it's, it's very direct to probe um, and uh, it allows us to integrate many of these degrees of freedom that we need to, for example, in an engine on chip. So it's introducing our piston, basically, um, to, to our engines. And uh, what is also great about uh, mechanical um, resonators on chip is that they can be amazingly good. They have a broad range of resonant frequencies. They have very high quality factors, meaning that um, they uh, lose energy at a, at a slow rate. Uh, they can couple to two level systems. So we can create engines that are coupled uh, to states that are quantum and that are capable of um, being set in, in coherent uh, states. Also, they have. Um, different zero point amplitude. The zero point amplitude is the minimum amount of displacement allowed by uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And um, this is a measure of how well also couples to different degrees of freedom. You can see here uh, different types of resonators, actually uh, carbon nanotubes, which are a type of resonators I will talk a bit about, are quite good in terms of zero point amplitudes. And, um, well, it gives us hope that we can bring these, all these elements together to make um, engines um, at these scales and in the quantum regime. But of course, we need to be able to measure displacement, so to probe the energy of the system. And um, we, we, we actually need a direct probe of, of displacement. And uh, it's great because we can store uh, the energy of our engine in that um, in the displacement, but we have to have a way to actually uh, tell 
um, how much this displacement is. And this is not easy, but LIGO has showed us one of the best ways to measure small displacements, and it's uh, cavity optomechanics. The idea is that we have radiation in a cavity, uh, that it's uh, uh, basically uh, trapped in that cavity, except that some of this um, radiation can leak out. So if one of the uh, sides of the cavity is the mechanical uh, resonator, when it moves, when it displaces, the radiation inside the cavity will experience changes that we could measure uh, out, outside the cavity. So we don't do this um, uh, cavity optomechanics uh, because we want to do everything on chip and uh, we have our uh, semiconductor devices, our solid state devices on chip. So what we do instead is circuit optomechanics, meaning that instead of a optical cavity, we have an electrical cavity. And uh, here um, it's uh, basically uh, the cavity is formed by an inductor and a capacitor. And you know that these um, circuits have a resonance frequency. So if we send some power to this circuit, uh, what we would see on the reflected uh, power, it's a dip at a certain frequency, uh, which is given by the values of the inductor and the capacitance. And um, well, basically uh, this dip has to do with the fact that at this frequency, the circuit absorbs the most energy. And uh, something we can do is to couple it capacitively, let's say, to a mechanical resonator. As the mechanical resonator moves, the capacitance of this circuit changes, and therefore the frequency of this um, dip uh, slightly shifts. So if we can, uh, we can measure, we can probe that a shift in, in frequency with high accuracy, then we can measure displacement with high accuracy. And that's exactly uh, what we can do in the lab. Actually, we can show we have shown, for example, with carbon nanotubes, that this method allows us to measure displacement uh, with accuracies that are less than 50 atomic diameters. So pretty cool tool. Uh, and it allows us to actually have a very direct probe of energy. So let me show you what we've uh, done uh, using mechanics in terms of exploring thermodynamics. One of our, our um, first kind of uh, uh, works on this was exploring the thermodynamic cost of timekeeping. So, um, you know, clocks are like um, engines. They just take some resources, they have some waste, and they perform a task which is measuring time. They register the, pa the passage of time. So this is a cartoon that my collaborators uh, put together. Um, the group of, uh, um, of um, Marcus Hoover. And you can see a, a, a kind of how this works. So there is a hot bath, a cold bath, and the clockwork produces uh, ticks in an, in an irreversible way, okay? So, um, Measuring time has a cost. And, um, you know, as a, a colleague of mine says, there is no free minute if you want to measure it. So uh, the question is now, how much is this cost and what are the limitations to uh, measuring time? So uh, what we've done in this case is an experiment in which we have a very thin membrane, a nanometer thick membrane, that it's suspended over two pillars. And we have uh, connected this um, uh, to metallic pillars that act as uh, antennas uh, to an LC circuit as the one that I presented before in order to uh, measure the displacement of the membrane by changes of uh, its capacitance to this antenna, okay? So we can drive this circuit, we can see the reflected power. We can also drive this antenna with power and uh, with some signal. And we, uh, in this case, uh, because we want in our membrane to act as a clock, uh, we have uh, fed this antenna with white noise. So what is the white noise gonna do here? Well, what we are doing effectively is heating up the membrane. So we are sending electrical noise so that the membrane effectively heats up, okay? And when the membrane heats up, it's gonna start moving. It's gonna start moving at, uh, at its um, resonance frequency. 
So here, what you can see is the uh, cavity signal that we see um, from the circuit, out from the circuit, as a function of time. And what you see is the membrane basically uh, displacing. This signal is uh, down converted. Uh, the membrane moves at around 100 kilohertz or so. Uh, but in this way, it's easier uh, for us to see the ups and downs. And uh, well, something we can do coming back to the clock story is to say, well, we can use this membrane as a clock. And well, every time the membrane goes up all the way, we say tick and tick. And here we have our clock, okay? But um, basically, uh, in order to get these ticks, we had to invest some resources, in particular, this Y noise that we are feeding. So this is a, a, a way for us to be able to quantify the thermodynamic resources we are introducing in this setup, and at the same time, be able to um, uh, measure uh, the passage of time and how accurate it is. So in particular, we define the accuracy of the clock as the time between ticks, yeah? And the standard deviation of that quantity of the time between ticks, okay? So you can already tell that if your clock goes tick, 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 it's bad clock, bad accuracy, okay? And we can estimate this accuracy from the experiment because as you can see, we have, we can measure the distance between ticks and we can calculate its standard deviation, okay? So we have this quantity here. And our uh, collaborators in Marcus Hoover's group have calculated and estimated the accuracy of an autonomous quantum clock. Now you're gonna tell me what does this have to do with a quantum clock? Uh, but um, you, you would see <laughs> that um, actually it's not that different because the accuracy of a quantum clock is proportional to the um, entropy um, production of the clock, okay? And with a factor that involves the Boltzmann constant. So, okay, we realize our clock is classical, so given the circuit and the noise sources in our circuit, we can ask ourselves the maximum accuracy that a classical clock can achieve in these conditions. And um, basically, which is basically given by how much we can distinguish different points in the signal, right? With a certain amount of noise. And we calculated this accuracy and we realized that it's also proportional to the entropy production of the clock which um, and now it's uh, with a different factor with respect to the quantum case in which we have uh, the temperature of uh, the noise temperature and the temperature of the cold end of the circuit. So actually you can see that both in the quantum and classical predictions, there is uh, an idea that the more accurate the clock is, the more entropy production it would have, okay? Now, um, how can we test these predictions with our experiment? Well, um, we can do the spectrum um, of the signal, uh, the frequency spectrum. And what you can see uh, is that, uh, well, we, we see basically in this blue uh, curve here, the frequency at which we drive the cavity, so at which we drive the LC circuit and two sibans that uh, have to do with nonlinearities in that circuit that grow enormously when the frequency hits the frequency of the mechanics. So these are these um, uh, yellowish kind of um, sidebands, okay? But the power below these sidebands, if, if, we, if we calculate it, uh, what it's telling us is basically how much um, power is dissipated in our circuit. So uh, basically it allows us to calculate the entropy production. So the power below the sibans divided by the frequency and the um, temperature of the circuit will basically allow us to calculate this entropy production. And it will allow us to compare with the values of accuracy uh, in, in this defined in this way here. So this is what we've done. 
And this is what we obtain. What we see uh, is that um, we have a different uh, powers of the Y noise we inject in the circuit. The accuracy uh, seems to grow for growing Y noise powers, you see? These different uh, colors have to do with how hard we are driving the, the circuit itself. You can see that when we drive the circuit quite hard, at some point the, the accuracy grows pretty quickly as we increase the, the Y noise, but then kind of saturates or starts behaving strange. And the reason is very clear. The reason is that um, as we drive the circuit very hard, then our uh, this doesn't help our clock to be more accurate. What happens is that its energy is dissipated in different ways and um, in, in different nonlinearities in our system. And that's why it's not useful anymore to, to continue um, increasing the Y noise power. So what we see is that the accuracy is actually proportional to the Y noise power. So this is already giving us a hint that, okay, if you want an accurate clock, you have to pay for it with uh, um, with thermodynamic resources, okay? So now we, uh, we can compare the accuracy calculated again in this way with the entropy production calculated by measuring the area below the, um, below the sidebands that I showed you before. And what we see is that indeed um, the, um, the accuracy uh, calculated in this way and the entropy production are linear. Um, so they are proportional. This means that uh, basically, given that the classical accuracy that we calculate is proportional to the entropy production, what we can say is that the accuracy is proportional to the entropy production, which is what was predicted both for the classical and quantum cases. So this is great. Um, now, of course, if the accuracy would be exactly equal to the classical accuracy, we would be following this line here, this dotted line here, but actually we follow this dotted line there. And the reason is that what we calculated was the maximum classical accuracy that we could achieve in our circuit. We basically did not achieve that. Uh, so we have a factor there of 10 approximately. Um, so basically with uh, this uh, setup, uh, we were able to um, uh, see that the accuracy of the clock is proportional to the Y noise power and is proportional to the entropy production of the clock. So um, our results actually point towards a, a universal relation that holds both in the quantum and the classical regimes between this entropy production and the clock accuracy. And this is a bit what I, I wanna tell you uh, uh, in, this, in this talk as well, that uh, I think these experiments are, are really promising because they are simple enough to account for the thermodynamic resources that we introduce, in this case, the Y noise. But at the same time, uh, they are kind of too complex to be completely modeled as a, a, a quantum system. So um, these, are in, these are interesting, um, promising devices to look at um, thermodynamic processes at these scales. Um, so this is uh, the paper here for your reference. It uh, has attracted a lot of lovely articles in the, in the press. So those are quite fun too. Um, but now let me uh, turn into more quantum experiments. And um, for this, we need to uh, basically um, go down in scales and go down in temperature. So in principle, um, I'm going to start talking about um, carbon nanotube devices. You can see um, this carbon nanotube um, here. Well, hopefully you can see it. It is suspended between two pillars and uh, it's controlled by gate electrodes lying um, below it. The carbon nanotubes are basically in the order of a few nanometers diameter, and they are exceptionally good mechanical resonators. Um, as I showed you before, they have, uh, because they are so tiny, they have um, quite high zero point amplitudes and um, they have very good quality factors and um, they can have quite high frequencies to work with. Um, 
So yeah, uh, and how do we cool them down? Well, we uh, we make a chip that uh, we introduce in our dilution refrigerators at approximately 20 millikelvin. And uh, well, here you can see an image of the lab and uh, the difficult thing, which is to fix uh, fit them in Oxford, really. Um, so here you can see uh, a, a zoom in on, on the chip. Um, you can see that our chip has many devices. And if you zoom in in one of these devices, you can see actually um, the uh, one of these carbon nanotube devices. You can see the, the marks of stamping the carbon nanotube across these pillars there, just there. And um, uh, a micrograph of the device with the gate electrodes. And here you can see in the sample board also the inductor and the capacitor that um, basically form the cavity uh, the, that allows us to measure the displacement as uh, I introduced before uh, in circuit optomechanics. So we do this with our carbon nanotubes to measure displacement. But let me first uh, tell you a bit about uh, how quantum states are, uh, can be accessed in these devices. In particular, let's start with single electron tunneling. And most of you might be uh, aware of how single electron tunneling works. Just for those of you that are not so aware, just a small recap. Um, but the idea is that uh, we cool down these devices and in this way we reduce thermal fluctuations. And we have a bias voltage and a gate voltage and we can measure the current across these uh, devices. But in these schematics here, you can see the electron reservoirs and the um, uh, transitions, energy transitions that are um, uh, quantized due to the fact that the um, uh, carbon nanotube uh, is small and actually these gate electrodes below it form a confinement potential for electrons. Now, if the bias is small, um, it might be your electron tunneling is uh, blocked. And the reason is that there is not enough energy to kind of um, make one of these energy transitions. So something you can do, it's basically move the gate uh, voltage, um, apply a gate voltage that allows us to shift the, um, these energy transitions. And um, this allows transport uh, to be activated. So if you measure the current as a function of gate voltage, you see oscillations that have to do with this um, you know, opening and closing of transport channels. Now, if we um, uh, also, if we are blocked and we increase the bias, again, we can activate a channel for transport. And if we do both, um, sweeping bias and sweeping gate voltages, we can see these diamond-shaped regions, which basically, show that current is blocked. In this case, it's the conductance, but that current is blocked inside this diamond shape regions. And uh, therefore we can control electron tunneling one by one, okay? Uh, but the interesting thing is that, okay, we can um, create, um, well, we, we have single electron tunneling. We can isolate single charges here, but also, we can uh, use the spin degree of freedom to um, uh, put uh, to um, basically encode a spin qubit on these devices. They are typically spin valley qubits, um, but um, this means that this system uh, has quite few interesting traits in the sense that we have a qubit and we have a mechanical resonator. And um, I will show you how uh, these two things talk to each other. So let's start by saying how the charge couples to the mechanics, okay? So indeed there is an interplay between single electron tunneling and mechanics. If you measure, well, these are again, these diamond shaped regions, not looking great actually, it's not the best diamonds ever. Um, but here you can see um, if you also, um, um, drive the carbon nanotube motion at different frequencies. And again, you sweep the gate voltage and you check the changes in the current. You would see that at each, um, let's say, point in which these diamonds cross, which is when um, basically uh, we have single electron tunneling at small bias, 
uh, we can see that the frequency of the nanotube uh, seems to drop quite a lot. You can see these arches here, hopefully. So what's happening there? What's happening is that the electron tunneling is actually affecting the mechanical frequency uh, and, uh, of, the, of the carbon nanotube, okay? So this process, the, well, this effect is called softening and uh, it's been seen in, in many, um, uh, well, many, many times. Now, what the question that we wanted to answer was, well, but exactly how much is this uh, coupling strength uh, because this tells us basically if we can use it for thermodynamics, if we can basically store energy in this battery that it's given by um, this, this um, carbon nanotube motion, okay? This piston, basically. So um, in order to do that, we had to understand basically um, where does this interplay uh, uh, come from? And there has been uh, quite a lot of theory papers that I uh, shamefully haven't cited here. But um, basically the approach we've taken was to say, well, we have um, this energy transition. This is an electrochemical potential that um, will move when the carbon nanotube displaces. And the reason is electrostatic, that when the carbon nanotube um, moves upwards, it would be further away from the um, gate voltage. And when it gets closer, um, then um, basically it will feel the potential more strongly. So um, we have basically, basically the, the, the carbon nanotube moving, um, it's like making your uh, gate voltage oscillate. So basically we have a, a, an electrochemical potential that depends on um, the coupling between the mechanical motion and, um, and the electrostatics, okay? So um, we, can, um, we can basically write this down and um, write down an equation of motion. And the interesting thing here is that in the equation of motion, uh, it appears a term that it has to do with the population of the, um, we have a term that, that, um, that is uh, proportional to the population of the uh, quantum well of, of, of the nanotube uh, that depends on the electrochemical potential, which depends on the displacement. So we have a population that depends on the displacement. And okay, this is the frequency of the mechanical resonator and again, the coupling strength. And this is the zero point motion of the displacement. So again, this is the uh, interesting bit because then we can calculate equilibrium position and see that it actually depends on the uh, population. And we can calculate as well a frequency and we see that it's modified by how the population changes with electrochemical potential, which again changes with displacement. So, um, well, this is uh, the model we, we've taken into account with two approximations. One is that we are in the adiabatic regime, meaning that the transport is lower, it's, um, sorry, a lot quicker than the mechanics and that the displacements are small. But when, then we see that um, if the electrochemical potential uh, is such that the population is always uh, one or between one and zero or zero, uh, then the displacement of the carbon nanotube would change in equilibrium position and in frequency. So this is great because it tells us that by directly measuring the displacement of the carbon nanotube, we can tell what's happening in terms of electron tunneling. And uh, basically it's giving us the relationship between these two effects. We can also uh, fit our effective frequency uh, to one of these uh, drops uh, and um, considering that the population um, also depends on the tunneling rates and so on. And we can extract basically the value of the coupling strength and uh, we have calculated uh, this number. Uh, we have improved on this number uh, since then actually, uh, but it's good, quite good news, let me tell you, because, um, because of this reason, which is that how strong the coupling 
is between these two effects is basically uh, accounted for by the ratio between the, the these coupling strengths and the mechanical frequency. And uh, this puts us uh, in the ultra strong coupling regime, which is great news because it means basically that uh, we can, well, this is, this type of uh, regime is promising for applications in quantum information processing, in high precision sensors, in cooling uh, of these mechanical uh, modes, in um, the transfer of quantum states uh, to mechanical motion, and uh, in the exploration of foundational quantum mechanics in general. So this was quite good news, and it means that um, we can indeed um, uh, well, uh, use this system for to probe thermodynamic processes. And we are going um, beyond this because now the question, because the charged qubits are so short-lived and they're not very useful, uh, therefore, is to see if there is a coupling uh, mechanism between the spin degree of freedom and the um, mechanics, and there is predicted one, and I cited the paper, just one slide uh, in my next slide, but there is predicted that it's um, uh, a coupling between the spin and the motion. Uh, and we have just, I have very fresh results um, that um, they are too fresh to show you, but we have evidence that indeed this is the case, which is fantastic, because then we have a spin and a mechanical, uh, a single spin and the mechanical motion of the carbon tube that talk to each other and therefore can be thought of as an engine in which uh, we can even cool down and, and um, heat the electron reservoirs and in which we can probe the work done by this spin by measuring the displacement of the carbon nanotube. So indeed, this is a paper I was mentioning in which this um, uh, in this effect was predicted. And uh, let me show you some also uh, theoretical proposals of how we can um, basically use these, um, uh, well, how, how can we uh, create a spin evolution uh, to determine if we can extract work from quantum coherences. So this is exactly uh, what we are uh, working on at the moment. Yeah, and um, it's all very exciting. So hopefully, um, maybe next time I will be able to show you um, the results on this side. So now, um, but you can imagine here, and this is a way to introduce my, uh, you know, start talking a bit about artificial intelligence. And the reason is that, okay, this is great. It's a great system because we have the qubit that we have to drive and control. Uh, we also have to control the, um, the electrostatic potential of the gate voltages and read out the displacement of the carbon nanotube and, 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 and this is becoming a very, very hard <laughs> a control um, problem that it's, it's becoming harder and harder. As our devices grow in complexity and in how interesting they are, right? But um, I'm not the only one with this problem. Uh, indeed, um, uh, you know, in the scaling of, of, uh, of qubits, um, that in every material realization from superconducting qubits, ion traps, semiconductors, uh, there is this control problem arising. And at the same time, we are seeing artificial intelligence doing fantastic things. But nobody likes that term, artificial intelligence. I, I would use machine learning instead. But we are seeing machine learning doing fantastic stuff, aren't we? I mean, uh, winning at, uh, at uh, games uh, such as Go and beating the best players in the world. Um, we've seen AlphaFold as well. And even um, robots writing uh, entire articles, which are uh, quite um, scary, actually. So. Um, you know, all a lot of fun. And but the question now is, and you know, the, there is already the question that, you know, if we had a quantum computer, can we accelerate our artificial intelligence algorithms? Probably. Um, we, the, that's an open question. Uh, but 
can, before we have these quantum computers, can we use these artificial intelligence approaches to be able to scale these circuits and to control them so that we can actually uh, work with very complex um, circuits? So, uh, well, this is what we've been doing uh, for a while now. And uh, let, let me show you the idea. So basically when we have our uh, quantum hardware, our devices in the fridge, we have our humans sending signals, analyzing, taking decisions about what um, measurement to perform next, about which parameter to change next. And it's time consuming and it's uh, not scalable. Uh, so in different material realization, in different uh, material systems and qubit realizations, you know, we try to do it with this in different ways, but uh, for example, in superconducting qubits, there are these um, directed acyclic graphs that have been used to go from basic tune-up to more careful tune-up. And, um, and well, our idea was to say, well, why don't we, instead of having humans going step by step by step in order to encode a qubit first and then optimize it and control it, uh, which is tricky because it's a huge parameter space and the more so as our circuits become more complex, there is big variability between devices. I mean, I have one device that it's nominally identical to the other, and still uh, the control signals have to change. And the reason is that, you know, qubits are really good sensors, but for the same reason, um, they are affected by their environment in a way that is different for each of them. And there are fabrication defects and, you know, material defects. Okay, and also we have to uh, work with very narrow margins in terms of the errors that we can uh, make. Okay, so uh, what my group has been um, doing was to basically replace the human in this task so that we can do more fun stuff and uh, let machine learning do the tricks. This is also not very easy. The reason is that we have very small data sets. You know, I'm sure you heard that machine learning is about big data. Um, not entirely true, but indeed it, it is a difficulty. And um, again, there is big variability between devices. So whatever algorithm does, this needs to be robust to work in different um, settings. We have quite flat optimization landscapes, meaning that our devices work okay in a very narrow um, part of the parameter space. And in the rest, it just typically doesn't work or, or does completely uh, different stuff. So it's difficult to actually optimize um, these, lands these landscapes uh, in these landscapes. And also we have noisy data. Yeah, and hysteretic in some cases, so tricky task. But let me show you what we have done. And um, for this, um, let's think of, a, of a, 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 our quantum devices. Basically, it's a very simple circuit in which we have the bias voltage and the gate voltages, and we can measure current, and um, that's it. So we have these inputs and outputs, and we have to follow a certain number of steps in order to encode a qubit, for example, in semiconductors and in particular um, in quantum dot based qubits, we can think of the alignment of spins of two electrons, like singlet, triplet qubits, um, or different kinds, but just to, um, just to focus on something. So now the question is what in these steps, which measurements do we require and which measurements that machines require, for example, yeah? So we do a step one, which is super coarse tuning as we call it, then step two, that it's a bit of characterization, then fine tuning, and finally a bit of optimization. And for this, we take different types of measurements that uh, typically are gate voltages, are current as a function, sorry, of gate voltages or current as a function of frequency and time. So where we are at, so this is all the work we've done on this. Um, it is quite a, a lot to go through, so I, I won't, I will just show you one of these things. Most of our algorithms are in GitHub, so you can go there and play with them. I encourage you to do that. 
And what you can see is that for the different steps grow, going from the super coarse tuning to optimization, we have been versatile in the types of machine learning techniques that we have used, basically because of the limitations in data. So we go from um, approaches that have nothing to do with deep learning to more deep learning approaches as we reduce the um, parameter space. So you can see as we go from step from one step to the other, the parameter sp space in, that we need to navigate gets smaller and then we can use other techniques. I'm not sure I'm running a bit out of time if I wanna leave you time for questions, um, but let me just show you quite a, a glance of what our course tuning algorithm does. So um, basically the problem is that, um, you know, when we use semiconductor devices, we cool them down. They act as transistors, really. They're most of the gate voltage space. Uh, it's not really useful because we have a current and that's it. And, or we have no current at all, not very useful. And what we are interested in, in order to encode our qubits, it's the transition between these two regimes where we can see features. Here you, you can see these lines that are evidence of single electron tunneling. So that's what we are looking for. And you can say, well, it's quite easy. Don't you see the lines there? Um, but as we grow in complexity, let's say three gates, uh, then, well, basically you can see there a model of this a surface separating current from no current. And we have to look for these features around this surface. So it starts to be more complex. Nobody does really these type of measurements because they are so time consuming. We've done it once um, <laughs> to just show you the surface, um, uh, how it looks and it's rough and um, it has uh, many features and things. And that's what we have to um, look for and which of these features are actually promising. And this is just three gate voltages. If you do a rough calculation, you will realize that Actually, with four gate voltages, looking for features that are millivolt size, you have four times to 10 to the 12 points to look at and at normal measurement speeds of current. That's, you know, crazy. <laughs> uh, so we don't do this, but just to give you an idea of how big the parameter space is. So our algorithm, basically what it does, it's in real time, it connects to our devices, and it doesn't have an idea of how this surface looks like, but it will um, perform some initial observations in real time uh, of when the current drops. And therefore it will be able to build a model of how this upper surface, let's say, looks. And, and then therefore it would be able to choose more promising locations next time, locations in parameter space, and then it can investigate further these promising locations and fit them back to the model. And in this way, we can um, basically uh, get better and better models of our hypersurface and tune our devices quite quickly, find these features quite quickly. Okay, so um, I'm going to skip now the details of this so that we go to the um, more interesting parts. Uh, what we have achieved with this algorithm was to be able to, from scratch, tune devices, completely different devices. I mean, laterally defined, nanowires, CMOS devices, whatever. It, the algorithm doesn't really care. Uh, what we, and we have managed to do it uh, a lot faster than human experts with, who take approximately more than three hours on this. You can see that the surfaces are quite different from this, for these different types of devices, which gave us as a hint as well that this is interesting information because by comparing these surfaces, we can map the variability of these devices um, and um, control it or, or compensate for it. So um, we have measured this variability both for different devices and for thermal cycles. Um, so this um, also allows us to have a tool which is quite interesting for uh, quantifying device variability. 
Now, a side note, again, uh, on uh, a, a just a, a very recent paper we put out, um, which has to do with, well, should machine learning, like in, in the case that I just previously showed you, be uh, data-driven or theory-led? In the case that I just show you, we, we have no information about the physics. We are just building a model out of um, a feat, basically, and we are not um, considering the physics of the device. So something that we are uh, looking into now is bringing more sophisticated models um, to into play with the machine learning algorithms. The problem, of course, is that simulations are slow. And if you're measuring simulations, well, I mean, simulations that are quite accurate are typically slow computationally. And if you're measuring in real time, then it becomes not very really useful if your simulation takes more time than to make a measurement. So there are, uh, we have introduced here a way to do it and that has actually allowed us also to um, uh, have an idea of, have an inference of the disorder potential, that it's something that we cannot measure directly. So um, that was um, a quite fun uh, paper to, um, uh, to write. So um, just to show you uh, this that um, we believe that we've done is, is quite useful because we actually control different um, uh, experiments around the world of our collaborators. And um, we, we are basically working with them to tune uh, different devices around the world and working with different companies on this as well. So it's fun. And now um, I think it's time for you to actually uh, uh, come back <laughs> to, to the thermodynamics team theme. And the reason, uh, so now that I bring them together is because, okay, there is a lot of information um, uh, talk both in artificial intelligence and in thermodynamics. And actually, you know, the Maxwell demon has to make a decision uh, over a certain, um, uh, likelihoods, and uh, that's exactly what Bayesian uh, optimizations and inferences are, are there for. So um, we have this this Maxwell demon, and, and very recently we had, uh, I'm sure, um, um, we we've seen this paper um, coming out on the thermal limit of qubit initialization with um, Bayesian Maxwell demons. So you can see how now this, this uh, game of trying to uh, build models and uh, making decisions to harness uh, different fluctuations is becoming very interesting. And not only that, but something that we are quite interested in, in going to is to say, well, can these devices be at networks themselves? So that's something we are quite interested uh, in looking at and seeing if these devices can learn and which with properties can they learn. And if they learn at different um, rates, um, depending on their properties. So um, let me just uh, wrap up. I showed you how we can measure, and we did the thermodynamic cost of timekeeping with um, mechanics and uh, circuit optomechanics. We have shown you that we, um, I have shown you that we have ultra strong coupling between single electron tunnel and mechanical motion, and that's very uh, useful for building engines uh, at the nanoscale. And in general, the potential of solid state devices for experiments that go all the way to quantum, to the quantum regime in, in thermodynamics. And uh, I showed you our effort on machine learning for quantum device control and hopefully let you uh, think about learning quantum devices. Uh, and um, just in the interest of time, I'll briefly thank my group and my collaborators. Um, there is a lot of people from my group missing from that photo because of COVID, <laughs> but hopefully we will be able to take a, a new photo um, all together soon. And uh, well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Natalia, for the fantastic talk. It's been really interesting and inspiring. So if you have questions, you can either unmute yourself or use the chat, whatever you prefer.
There is a question by Andreas Hotel. Just go ahead, Andreas. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, so um, I have a question about the ultrasound coupling. Um, normally, when uh, people talk about this in quantum optical mechanics, uh, basically there's this uh, like strong coupling where you start to see the hybridization between the uh, mechanical mode and uh, uh, the uh, 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 and the electronic uh, mode, uh, and then you at some point reach the ultrasound coupling where your coupling parameter becomes larger than even the resonance frequencies. Um, so, um, do you see any indications of such a hybridization or such an anti-crossing of the uh, different phenomena? And uh, well, uh, I mean. How is this related maybe to the occupation being uh, uh, like basically a time average variable? Yeah, that's a, that's a, well, I, I also um, uh, have the same kind of uh, questions actually. Uh, we, we don't see the typical, you know, circuit QED kind of uh, anti-crossing. Well, I don't, I don't really, know exactly where to look for it um, but um, something that we definitely see are um, that these these artists and uh, they they become so in this case I, I show some that are that are very well behaved mm -hmm. but we have some that actually never cross so that they end up being parallel to each other I don't mm -hmm think that we have an example here and we and we see them going even upwards and, and downwards so that's where I, I would be very interested to discuss with you actually Andreas mm -hmm. what do you think of this because we are still kind of looking into it yeah. um but yeah, we, yeah okay yeah thanks okay thank you Andreas so there is another question by Clivia Sotomayor go ahead Clivia Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, really exciting, uh, Natalia. I have a, a question about the first part, uh, where you talk about the classical and the quantum accuracy. And particularly my question refers to the bit where you have to measure the temperature. So how do you measure the temperature in this case? We don't. We, we don't measure the temperature. Uh, what we, um, we we know the noise temperature and this has to do with our electronics, let's say. So we, we basically plug the temperature of the circuit, which is a room temperature and the, we calculate the noise temperature of our circuit. But we don't have a need of measuring and that, 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 that would be very tricky to measure the temperature of the mechanical mode because that, Again, I, I wouldn't know how to, well, there are ways, but it's, it's, it's tricky and I don't think we could do it in this case. Okay, thank you. Okay, so more questions? Maybe, maybe I have a question in the, oh, well, there's another one by- If, I, if I may, if I may, I mean, I'm not going, going I don't want to take up anyone's time. But um, about the um, about the deep learning models, or about the auto tuning more or less, yeah. Uh, um, I mean, this is this is great because I let's just say I still remember sitting at a, a multi dot system as an undergrad and uh, uh, and tuning uh, for quantum dots. Uh, um, so uh, my 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 question is, um, I mean, in a way, such a deep learning network is 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 kind of a black box. Uh, yeah. Uh, so. Um, you have to put in some assumptions and you have uh, basically to, to trust the network to come to the right conclusion. So what, what assumptions do you put in, for example? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, uh, indeed it is a bit of a black box. And um, I mean, for the course tuning that I just showed you, it, uh, which, which as you mentioned is quite time consuming, um, we, didn't, we didn't use any deep uh, learning because we don't have data. I mean, you do this in an eight-dimensional parameter space if you have eight dimensions of eight-gate mm -hmm. electrodes. 
So you don't have that kind of data. We, we took that data that I just showed you in three dimensions and it took us months. So we, we don't have that type of data. So what we do is to use Gaussian processes. So basically, you know, start fitting and, and trying to um, uh, predict the model mm -hmm. uh, in a way that it doesn't have any assumptions, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, there are assumptions in the sense that you need to ramp, uh, you start ramping from a point and you know that at some point you would, the current would drop. And that's an mm -hmm. assumption, right? Because, mm -hmm. um, but apart from that, it, it's quite general. And that's why it works quite well uh, between the among devices now okay. when you try to do other stuff like for example we have just um put out a paper showing how to um distinguish uh bias triangles with polyspin blockade so now you can use deep learning because now you have a lot of uh you have a lot more data not a lot but a, a lot more and you can say, well, you know, even you can use simulators at that level. Mm -hmm. You cannot use simulators here because it's so crazy, <laughs> but you can use simulators here and you can produce a lot of data with your simulators. And, um, and there, you, of course, you are, put, you are taking into account a lot of assumptions because when you, when you build a simulator, it has some parameters and you can vary the parameters as much as you want, but still, there are assumptions on those models. And um, luckily you can always, you know, introduce some bizarre um, examples to, um, so that it doesn't narrow down so much what, mm. what you're looking into, but. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so more questions? Yeah, so I, I wanted to ask you, Natalia, in the in the part concerning the entropy of timekeeping, at some point you mentioned that despite the simplicity of the system, uh, still modeling the reservoirs as open quantum systems is, is not enough for something like this or too complex. What, what do you mean exactly there? I'm, yes, I'm not... that's, that's a, a, a tricky. <laughs> um, I, I don't think I phrased it exactly as in this case. What I'm meaning is that uh, in this case, um, we have, let's say, what I'm trying to say is in comparison with, for example, an ion trap where, you know, you can model exactly to some extent, you know, your mechanical degrees of freedom and your, um, and your energy levels and energy transitions and uh, in that case, you have reservoirs that, al although you know they act as reservoirs, they are pretty much um, you can model them. Let's say. Okay, so the question is, can we go to more uh, systems in which reservoirs are actually uh, more um, uh, well difficult to model? And in, in this case, um, well, this is one case, but also it's more thinking on, for example, the carbon nanotube where you. Um, again, have reservoirs that are therm thermal baths that are not exactly, well, it depends what you're doing, but uh, it's, it's, it's not even exactly clear what the thermal bath. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, it's, it's, even the definition of reservoir is not that well defined in that sense. But, but in some sense, you can have reservoirs that have the properties of actual reservoirs. You see what I mean? That, that, that they, indeed, they are so reservoirs that they don't change the temperature uh, in contact with a given system. So, so you know, they, they are attractive on that sense, um, but um, but not, you cannot just, you know, model it simply. Okay, yeah. That's... Okay, so more questions for Natalia? I see no further questions. Okay, so thank you very much for the fantastic talk, Natalia, again. Thank you, Ramon. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, um, for joining. And, and yes, see you next Thursday. <laughs>